So uh, Kwaku was the son of a UN peacekeeper. Uh, spent the first 12 years of his life uh, between Ghana, Israel and Syria. He moved to West Yorkshire at the age of 12. He graduated from the University of Nottingham with a degree in Computer Science and Management. I, I make the point that how could you not get that work? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. Um, he joined UBS Investment in 2003 following a summer internship. In late summer 2007, Quakey issued control of an asset book worth over $50 billion. This book was central to the rec recovery and growth of UBS following the global financial crisis. Now, what came next uh, has been widely documented in the media. But ultimately, in 2011, Kwaku sent an email to his accountant accepting responsibility for $2.3 billion worth of losses. He was arrested, charged, and tried on four counts of false accounting and two counts of fraud by abusive position. Ultimately, he was acquitted of four charges, but was found guilty of two and sentenced to seven years in prison. Having served half his term, Kwaku was released in 2015, and he's currently embroiled in a legal battle to resist deportation from the UK Home Office having lived in the UK for nearly a quarter of a century. He is dedicated to helping others learn from his unique experience in an effort to contribute to the restoration of the social contract through positive cultural and systemic change in our finance industry and beyond. Oh, I like that. It's a nice punch and punchy line. I do like that. Now at 36, he is an accomplished, engaging and inspirational keynote speaker who has spoken to audiences as diverse as six formers, through to graduate students, through to CFA charter holders, FTSE 100 leaders, Global for Banking Summit, and Oxford University Students Union. We are now pleased to welcome here to Liverpool John Walsh University. And I promise I will be quiet now. But if I can just introduce you now with uh, the usual way. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Stephen, for doing my entire talk. <laughs> There's now nothing left to say. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I think. Um, it is true that by now most people know my story. I think what's important for me though is that whilst the headlines are really important, um, I also need to sort of recap the story and put in the bits that are missing because it's that context I think that really helps to drive home um, what were the causes for what happened at UBS um, in the summer of 2011 but also why I made the decisions I made and what I think, you know, after five years of reflection, um, there is to gain uh, for society as a whole, for the finance industry too. And in this case, I think it's, I'm really grateful to have an opportunity to look at it from a legal point of view too. Um, because ultimately my experience of the last five years tells me that both regulation and the law don't work to regulate and control behavior in our institutions and especially not in our finance institutions. Well, um, I think it's important to go right back to the beginning and um, bring you back to where we were when this story first broke in September of um, 2011. Um, when the headlines broke, um, this is the person I became. Um, to the world, and it's a, it's a statement to you. So, to the world, I'm a criminal mastermind fraudster, a rogue trader who lost his bank $2.3 billion. My name became global headline news on 15 September 2011 as the press amassed around Bishopsgate Police Station in London. It seemed that the world would finally get to punish a banker after the excesses that had led to the biggest financial crisis in living memory. I represent all that is wrong in our finance industry. A greedy, selfish, arrogant, hard partying, womanizing, gambling, lying, cheating fraudster of a banker. And for that, I had to spend three and a half years of a seven year sentence in prison. The problem is, that's not who I am. And to this day, it still hurts to think that that's the image of me that was sold to the world. Um, and it hurts because I know my friends don't believe that's who I am either. And it hurts because I've spent the last five years trying to help everyone understand that that's not who I am. But it's important that I let you see who the real me is. 
Um, because otherwise, it's hard for you to learn the lessons that need to be learned. So, as Stephen said, I was born in Accra in Ghana. Uh, my roots go back to a little village called, uh, called Dikato, uh, which is by the Volta River. Um, my father was the eldest son in a family of eight with six sisters and another brother. His life started as a young man who would go fishing in the Volta River in the morning before going to school. But he was smart and conscientious, and he decided at a young age that all he wanted in life was to be a farmer and to buy a tractor in order to be able to look after his family. So he applied for agricultural school, and uh, although he was accepted, didn't receive his acceptance enrollment letter. And so he had a big fight with his head of school, and they managed to come to an agreement whereby he applied to go to secretariat school. That then led to him eventually working for the United Nations. And one day, I think sometime in 1984, standing by the telex machine as a message came through, his name was at the top, and it said that he needed to move to work for the United Nations True Supervision Organization in Jerusalem. That's how I ended up moving to Israel as a four-year-old. And between 1984 and 1990, we lived in Israel, Damascus, and Baghdad. And the lessons I learned, the first lessons I learned as a young person were about what needs to be done to resolve conflict between two parties. How either the most responsible one, the one willing to lose face, or the most powerful one in the party needs to do something in order for the conflict to end, for the pain and human suffering to end. Then in 1992, because of this, the uh, instability in my life, my parents decided that what I needed was to be sent to, be, to boarding school in England. Um, this was partly because my dad was just never at home, um, and partly because they felt that I deserved the best education they could afford. Um, and so I was sent to school in England in 1992, and I was sent to a Quaker boarding school in Yorkshire, a school called Ackworth near Wakefield, which had the motto, non sibi sed omnibus in Latin, which means not for self, but for all. Um, and I think what's important, uh, what's important about that to me is that it reinforced the lessons I learned as a young child, actually. And by the time I was 18, I became head boy of that school, primarily because I lived those values. After leaving school, I went to Nottingham University, where I did computer science and management, and um, was heavily active in the Students' Union, was a member of the International Students' Bureau, spent a lot of my energy, instead of focusing on my studies, trying to help students to integrate um, and fit in, because I was sort of this middleman between what it meant to be a foreign national, international student, and what it meant to be British. And I guess for that reason, I fit in at university, but also that I had something to give, which was to bring everyone together. I suspect when I applied for my internship at UBS in February of 2002, one of the reasons which led them to give me a job offer so quickly was because those were the things, those were the values that I carried, interestingly enough. I did a really interesting internship uh, where I was asked to build a tool that would calculate the value of UBS's assets under management globally. They didn't have a tool that would do that prior to that, and my job was to automate that process. And as a young intern in a massively rapidly growing bank, it was an incredible opportunity to learn that this institution would give someone like me a lowly intern, the opportunity to reach out to pretty much anyone in the institution, no matter their seniority, no matter what role they had, in order to allow them to achieve something that ultimately met a common purpose within the institution. At the end of the internship, my manager and I stood side by side, and we hit enter, and um, 
the answer that came back was that we had 1.3 trillion dollars of assets under management globally. Now, perhaps it's important at this point to have a bit of a history lesson. To understand how it is that one institution can have that much, that quantity of global assets under management. Most of our, many of our preeminent economic thinkers today still debate whether or not the repeal of Gla the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999, replaced by the graham leach bliley Act, led to the global financial crisis. Nevertheless, it is difficult to argue that that act didn't remove barriers to consolidation in the finance industry. That act, that legislative choice, ushered, helped to usher in our age of too big to fail banks. But most significantly, I think, that moment also marked legislative approval of a cultural evolution that had been taking hold over the previous three decades. Greater consolidation, increased corporate power, more risk, and the maxim that greed is good. Consequently, I think this is important for me, in banking and professional services, manipulation of processes, systems, and societies became widely accepted as a means to such ends. Maybe it was difficult at that time to understand what price we'd all have to pay for the behavioral changes we were baking into our societies. But even so, heightened complexity, inequality, risk of instability, conflict, and ultimately, a collective loss of our moral clarity delivered a global financial crisis. Our response to the existential threat of the crisis consisted of quantitative easing, austerity measures, and increased regulation. Whilst that combination of measures has led to markets and profits at all-time highs today, they have not protected us from cultural and systemic failure in our banks and finance institutions. Nor have they protected us from the public perception that the product of our shared human endeavor is being unequally distributed. Meanwhile, a renewed push for deregulation in our finance industry has led to fears we will reverse the progress we've made since 2008. Now, upon after five years of re reflection, I think that the highest function we require from our regulators is that they guide our institutions to contribute to a more equitable operation of our global society. But there's a question that is becoming increasingly impossible to ignore. Has regulation encouraged more respect for the social contract between our institutions and our communities? Brexit, Trump, migration, growing populism, instability around the world, they all suggest otherwise. In the financial sector, we tend to revere those best able to embrace and control risk as our most creative employees. Creativity is vital, but the pursuit of risk for profit hasn't de delivered a better world. Whilst regulation might reflect legislative statements of intent, it does not do what we need of it to protect both the risk takers and societies within which they operate. So if regulation isn't working anyway, then what can our regulators do to protect us? This is the question I'm often asked when I speak, when I try and help others learn from the mistakes we made at UBS, the mistakes that led to a $2.3 billion loss for which I took responsibility in September of 2011. What a lot of people don't understand is that the system in which I operated at UBS eventually evolved through the crisis to desperately try and minimize cost and maximize profit at the expense of human relationships to such an extent that it became unstable as complexity and risk grew. 
are attempts to navigate a cultural and systemic minefield, whilst increasing tolerance for risk led to mistakes that morphed into disaster. After the, mistake, after the price that I was asked to pay for my mistakes, it seems clear to me that to make regulation work, we need to perhaps reduce the type of complexity that leads to a firm that's been built by combining all the various different cultures of the individual companies that were brought together through mergers and acquisitions to create the big institutions. I think what we really need to do is reprioritize the primacy of our shared responsibility to each other as human beings, as members of a shared global society. The question is, what was the effect of the financial crisis on UBS? And this is where we begin to learn what actually drove the losses that hit my desk. In September 2006, I was asked to join the ETF desk. Uh, and at that time, there were two other traders on the book. It was UBS's biggest trading book and the fastest growing product sector in the global equities market. My learning curve was steep. The workload was unimaginable. 15 to 18 hour days were not uncommon. There were occasions when I actually slept under my desk to try and meet the deadlines I was being set. But that shouldn't be a surprise to you. It's always been my mindset. Um, I never believe I'm as smart as everyone around me. Um, so what I try to do is put in the hours. If it takes 15 hours to do something that someone else can do in eight hours, I will spend 15 hours doing it. Because in my mind, that's the only way I can learn. And if I learn, then eventually the workload will reduce. When I first started on the ETF desk, my hope was that my workload would reduce and that I would get my life back. Unfortunately, things didn't get any easier. In the summer of 2007, as queues formed outside Northern Rock, the head of my desk, who had built up the trading book from a balance sheet footprint of $200 million to over $50 billion in the short period of two and a half years, left the bank. At that time, I had 10 months of experience on the trading book. And John Hughes, who would become my supervisor, had only 20 months of experience. And with our combined 30 months of experience, we were left to run a $50 billion trading book. And sometimes I kind of think back, and I remember what it felt like then. What it felt like then was, oh my god, they trust us. They believe in us. They think we're good enough to run a $50 billion book. I look back now and I think, well, $50 billion is equivalent to the total GDP of a small country like Ghana, the total output of the 25 million people who live in Ghana today. And if you can imagine the complexity of the output of 25 million people and try and like compress it into a trading book, you start to get an idea of what the true risks were that we were trying to manage. What made it worse was that we were entering the worst financial crisis that the world has ever seen. But our job was to try and survive the crisis. UBS itself was going through an existential crisis. Most of the senior managers, the veteran banking superstars who had built the bank up into, what it, into the global behemoth it had become, left the bank. They saw the tsunami that was coming. They saw the crushed bonuses, the volatile markets, the headcount cuts, etc., that were to come because of their experience. And rather than stay and guide us through it, they left. So did the middle managers who had been in the bank for five or six years 
They left too. Why? Because they had all the experience. They added the expertise. They were the ones who really ran the business. And they were able to move to other banks on guaranteed bonuses that meant that they would be able to ride out the financial crisis. So for them, it was a no-brainer. You had to go rather than stay at UBS, especially if you knew that UBS was about to be hit with a $60 billion loss in the subprime market. So who was left? There were juniors like me with a total of four years experience and 10 months on a trading book. And then there were a few senior managers who were the ones who either hadn't been paid enough or hadn't saved enough to be able to leave the industry or were not respected enough to move to another bank and they stayed. So you had this really top heavy institution with very senior managers <laughs> and very junior traders at the bottom. As a trading desk, as an ETF desk, we began to experience losses too. So whereas we were in 2007 making something like $65 million a year, by 2008 we were coming in to work day in, day out, running our profit and loss accounts and finding that we might have lost $2 million, $3 million, $5 million. And we wouldn't know why. The true reason was that the market was experiencing di dislocations that were creating opportunities for other people. Our counterparties tended to be big pension funds, big hedge funds, who had way more experience than us. And the simple experience deficit meant that we just couldn't compete with them. And they were effectively taking us out day in, day out. Now what we would do is we would go to our managers and we would say, uh, we're down $5 million, don't really know why, I'm trying to figure it out. By the end of the day, I'll definitely have an answer. And you'd go back at the end of the day, having figured it out, and it took you the whole day whilst trying to manage the rest of the book. And you would say, well, I don't really know, what, what are we supposed to do with this? Because actually, this is a structural problem. It's a resource problem. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that we could have done anything to avoid this loss. And you would invariably get sent away with, listen, you guys are the experts in this thing. No one else knows how to run an ETF book. You've got to figure it out. So, I mean, of course, the thing is, it takes a lot of courage to go to your senior manager and say, I don't know what I'm doing, or can I have help, please? So, if you get sent away with that answer, eventually what you do is you say, well, he wants me to figure something out, and there's no point asking him, because he has no answers. And so, eventually, we stopped asking, and we tried to develop our own system, which is how we got to the umbrella. The idea behind the umbrella was that it would pr protect us from the rain that we were um, being <laughs> drowned in day in, day out. And what we'd noticed was that the market was dislocated on effectively a short-term basis. So it's like an elastic band. Prices would go up, prices would go down, but eventually they would revert back to some kind of mean. And it's sort of like this sort of stretching elastic band that either goes down or it goes up over time. And what you could do is if you could ride out the volatility, cancel out the short-termism, and buy yourself enough time, you could take longer-term decisions. And all we wanted to do was be able to take longer-term decisions, to be able to make a price to our clients and not lose a ton of money because we had to unwind the risk straight away. So what we realized was that if we developed this umbrella in which we put real profits, we would be able to offset the short-term losses with the real profits in the umbrella and buy the time we needed to run the positions for longer until they came back into profit and then you could close them out. It's really straightforward, not particularly complicated. It's sort of like a savings account. 
you know, in your life, in your normal life, if you have a savings account and you get hit with an unexpected cost, you offset it against your savings until you get some money in and then you put it back in your savings. Literally, that's all it was. We weren't trying to be heroes. We weren't trying to pad our bonuses. I mean, if we were trying to pad our bonuses, all we would have needed to do was release the profits from the umbrella into our real P&L and say, look what we did. We generated this profit. But actually, between 2008 and 2010, we had $40 million of profits which we held in the umbrella. And all we tried to achieve was that we'd come to the end of each year, literally flat P&L, without losing money. Because we figured out that the book was costing us about $40 million to run. And that's all we had to achieve. Just survive the crisis without losing any money. That's all we needed to do. But what's actually interesting is the umbrella itself was an evolution of another accounting practice where basically if we had a five million dollar loss or profit we could we would previously go to our accountant and say we're up five million dollars I need you to suspend the P&L until I figure it out and we would get them to just hold it in a suspense account until such a time as we wanted them to release it let's say we made a profit somewhere else let's say we finally found the source of an error and they would just unwind that PL. So all we were doing was taking control of that process into our own hands. As a result, this process became an acceptable practice. Basically, everybody knew about it. Our accountants could see it. The trading desk could see it. And our trade support people could see it. Right? So it didn't feel like what we were doing was wrong, basically. Plus, there was this halo effect. We'd finally built some confidence. We were able to make more aggressive prices. Our sales traders and our salespeople were able to give aggressive prices to their clients. Their clients started to respect them more. They started to give them more business. So we got more business, which allowed us to generate more profit and create more credibility for the business. So there was always this halo effect, this idea that we were finally getting through the pain of not knowing what we were doing as juniors on the biggest book in the bank. And by 2010, we had effectively survived the crisis, right? UBS had managed to pay back the $60 billion bailout money from the Swiss taxpayers. And now it was time, we felt, to try and push the boundaries. Because we had a new CEO and what he wanted from us was that we would bring UBS back to its former glories. He came up with this phrase, we will not rest. And we were supposed to live this idea that we would, until we'd gone all the way to what our clients needed, or until we'd pushed the boundaries enough to generate the profits that would satisfy our targets, we would just keep pushing. We would not rest. And it became our mantra. Now, what's interesting about the UBS trading floor is that it's a massive open space on the third floor with a huge atrium up to the ceiling with a skylight at the top. And all the floors between the third and the seventh could look down. And we could play music or sounds or talk to each other on these, uh, these things called stents. They're basically like a a boom box on everyone's desk so you could talk to everyone or you could talk to the whole the whole floor and our desk was right in the middle so we were like the energy source for the trading floor so often our bosses would come to us and say listen the floor is a bit quiet can you make some noise literally just make some noise and so we would play Ozzy Grubel our CEO with his deep gravelly voice telling us why he had come out of retirement to rebuild UBS into this magnificent bank once more. We will not rest. And of course, we were no longer junior traders. We'd survived the crisis, now we were the veterans. And so we had this big responsibility on our shoulders. The bank created this new group called Global Synthetic Equities, which was meant to be a driving source of profits for the equities business. And our desk was going to be the central driver of profit for global synthetic equities. 
right? So we were going from being a local team based in London, but with a complex book, a book with 4,000 different stocks on it that traded globally with commodities, fixed income, FX, every asset class you can think of, where our job was to take complexity and simplify it down and give it to our clients so that they had simplified access to a complex underlying benchmark. Now, in 2007, which was a good year, the GSE business globally made something like $150 million of profit. Now, that put UBS at number nine in the league table for GSE. Number one was Deutsche Bank, and they were making about $3 billion a year from GSE. And we'd gone to Deutsche Bank and recruited some of their senior traders and some of their salespeople, some of their structurers, all to come to UBS to teach us how to make money in GSE. And the idea was that we would go from number nine to number three, and position number three, to be in position number three, we would have to make $900 million of profit a year. So that's a six-fold increase from what we were making in the good days of 2007. And we, the ETF desk, were supposed to drive most of that. As a result, we became proprietary traders. We basically took risk with the bank's money to generate profit for the bank. And of course we used the umbrella, because the umbrella had become a central part of our accepted practice. Our bosses knew, our trade support knew, our risk managers knew. If I deliver you a $10 million profit day, and I only show you $100 million of risk, but the market only moved 1%, you know I had a billion dollars of risk on. Some of our senior traders are the smartest people in the world. They'd also sat in the very seats we were sitting in. They knew what we were doing. By June of 2011, we generated $135 million of profit for GSE. The four of us, now there were four of us, the four of us on our desk alone. But it wasn't enough. We were a quarter of GSE's global profits. And we were clearly going to miss our target. So we went on a call, June the 12th. <laughs> uh, and on the call, we were told that our profit target for the year was being increased by 50%. So not only did we have to replicate what we'd already done in the six months before, which by the way, we'd done with only four hours sleep a night every night for six months, now we had to do even more for the following six months. And of course, what you do is you take more risk. Now I remember a conversation with my supervisor going, it's too much pressure. Because it was destroying my family life. It was taking too much. I didn't have the energy to call my friends. I didn't have the energy to pick up the phone when my mom called me. It was too much pressure. And I said so. But all I got back was, don't worry, Quake, we'll be okay. Don't worry about it, man. We've done this before. The problem is, we were making our money from proprietary decisions for the bank. That meant we had to read the market, try and figure out what it was going to do next, and make a call on what would happen next. To do that, you have to have consensus. Everyone has to agree what the market's going to do next. Now, I don't know if you remember, but 2011 pretty much started with the Greek debt, debt crisis. Then there was the Japanese earthquake with the tsunami. Then there was the US debt ceiling debacle. Then US debt got downgraded. Plus you had a bunch of protests around the world with students all standing up against austerity. And the way a few of us saw it was that all of this would lead to a slowdown in the global economy and markets selling off. And we fought about it. I sent uncountable number of emails saying, I think the market's going to crash. 
And if it crashes, we're not going to be ready for it. But unfortunately, that view didn't align with the house view of the bank. The problem, of course, is that investment banks tend to only make money in stable and rising markets. Because otherwise, your clients don't trade. There's no activity in a, in a frightened market. So our research team sent a note, 147-page research document, to our clients <coughs> saying that the market was going to be stable to rising. And here I was, one of the loudest voices on the trading floor, saying, it's going to crash like Cassandra or Chicken Little. The sky is going to fall down. And eventually, I got taken outside by one of my senior traders. And he said to me, look, quick, you're on your own. You know, you can't trade as if the market's going to fall if you're on your own. Because if it doesn't, you'll be disowned. And that should have been a warning sign. But I didn't see it because of loyalty and all of that. But anyway, eventually I came under a lot of pressure from increasingly senior people who eventually came and said, look, the market's going to rally. You can't keep telling our clients it's not. So on July the 1st, 2011, I said in a text and I wrote, you know, in a WhatsApp message, in an instant messenger message to my colleague, all right, fine. If everyone thinks I'm wrong, then I must be wrong. I'll just go along with everyone else. The problem is, on the 1st of July 2011, the market started to sell off. And it didn't stop selling off for the next six weeks. And in that time, some of the markets that we had positions in sold off 35% as I'd originally predicted. And the problem is that we'd lost resilience, we were tired, we weren't sleeping, we had a ton of conflict between us, and ultimately, that conflict told. We lost our sharpness, we lost our ability to make rational decisions, we lost our ability to understand the morality behind what we were choosing to do. And in a desperate bid, to recoup the growing losses, we chased the market as it went lower and lower. I used the word we advisedly. I wasn't on my own. Everyone around me knew what we were doing. Well, Monday, I think it was the 11th of April, was the Monday that London was burning. The riots had taken hold that weekend. And all around us on the big HD screens, London was literally burning. And we came in with this massive position that we lost control of clearly and didn't really understand. And the market opened down 10%. And I said to my supervisor, look, we can't run the position anymore. If we keep it and it goes down another 10%, we're going to be down another billion dollars. We cannot afford to be running these positions. We've got to shut it down. We'll shut it down. We'll figure out what to do next. So we shut it down. Then there was the conversation. What do we do next? Well, we were problem solvers. That's what we do. So we had to find a way to recoup the losses. That's what we do. We're traders. That's our responsibility. But we got to September, and we went for a drink, basically at all bar one. And we sat around the table, and we said, what are we going to do? We batted it around. There were kind of two choices. We either try and buy more time, which would involve sending emails, mischaracterizing the trades to those people outside our circle who didn't really understand it. <laughs> or we go forward together. We make it public, this is our loss, and let go of it. And say, it's your problem, you deal with it, we've had enough. We could have done that too. But the desk didn't want to do that. So I eventually, after an hour of going around the circle with the desk, said, look, guys, 
I can't carry on. I think we need to end it because the repercussions are growing. So if you guys aren't willing to go forward, I'm going to send an email taking responsibility for it. Since so many people know what's going on, I'll get fired and you'll be allowed to carry on the desk and rebuild it after the loss is crystallized. And of course, as you can imagine, the guys on the desk were like, really? You do that? So I sent the email. And that's when the justice process kicked in. Which is what we're here to really talk about. I sent the email to UBS. UBS called me in up to the seventh floor. I get there, someone asks me some questions, and they say, okay, we think you need some legal support, you know, it would help if you were protected, you know, just in case. Have you got a lawyer? No, I haven't. Okay, well, we'll call you one. So I sit there, hour and a half later, these lawyers turn up from Kingsley Napoli. Now, the significance of it wouldn't dawn on me for a few months, but basically, they were the lawyers that had defended Nick Leeson. And so the headlines the next day were Quaker Adaboli, Ghanaian immigrant, rogue trader, being defended by lawyers who defended rogue trader Nick Leeson. And it just, you know, you just, it doesn't dawn on you. Like you just sat there, a bit of a deer in the headlights, trying to sort of just get your way through these moments. The other warning sign that I should have picked up on was when they turned up and they said, all that UBS wants to know is who else was involved. It didn't register as a loaded question. It didn't register to me that actually they shouldn't have been speaking to UBS at all. But I answered the question. And as I started to tell them, everyone who was involved, like initially I was like, look, all I'm trying to do is protect everyone. I don't really want to tell UBS anything on the record. Um, you know, I've sent the email now, let's just deal with the repercussions. They're like, no, no, UBS really need to know and maybe you can help them. So I start to tell them what happened and they eventually, and you know, you get more and more senior and then eventually like, they go, wait, hang on a second. Are you sure you can prove the involvement of these senior people? And of course, then you start racking your brain and you're a bit nervous. You can't remember where the emails are, or the messages that will prove it. And so you end up being quiet because you don't want to say anything you can't prove. Because ultimately I don't want to upset anyone in the bank. Anyway, eventually at about 12.30, someone comes in and says, oh, you'll be able to go home in 10 minutes. We just got to wrap some stuff up. And then half an hour later they come in and they say, um, we're really sorry. We know you said, we said you could go home, but we had to call the police. After two nights in a police cell, same lawyers, I was eventually charged with two counts of false accounting and a further two counts of fraud by abuse of position. Now what's interesting about that is Having told me to speak to UBS in full, I was now being told not to talk at all to the police. And so I made no comment the entire time I was in the police station. In hindsight, that was my only opportunity to speak to someone in a regulatory capacity of one kind or another. I've never spoken to the regulators and actually never spoken to the police. So they don't have my version of the story on record. Nevertheless, uh, 40 hours later, I'm taken in and out of the magistrate's court. And the narrative is sealed, right? Culture is really important. Because by Friday night, I'm in Wandsworth prison and the narrative is sealed. The pictures have gone around the world. The headlines, rogue trader, Quaker Adaboli, Ghanaian immigrant, no ties to the UK. 
no bail, no ability to fight, no ability to clear your mind and think. You're in a hostile environment and you don't understand why. What's interesting is it took two months of being in Wandsworth, slowly catching up on the sleep I'd lost over the previous four years, to finally wake up to what was happening. And it suddenly hit me that part of the reason that we get repeated instances of cultural and systemic failure is that we always look for one person or a small group of people to blame. Because that's the way in which we explain that it's not systemic in nature, but rather the actions of a bad person. And eventually I woke up. Eventually I thought, actually I really need to tell this story. Because if I don't, it'll be impossible to help other people learn. Now the only way to get the story out is to get the evidence. And the only way to get the evidence is to plead not guilty. If you plead guilty, you get no disclosure. If you get no disclosure, no one will ever believe anything you say. I could not stand in front of you and tell you any of the things I'm telling you right now because it's not public. And it was only through pleading guilty, not guilty, getting disclosure, going to trial, going through the battle, that I'm able to stand in front of you right now and tell you this story. The problem is, in hindsight, I think it's dangerous for us to allow this to continue. It's dangerous for us to continue our blame culture because it stops us from learning the true cause of failure. It stops us from finding solutions and most importantly leaves the individuals who remain within the institutions at risk of the same failures. That's not good for them. It's not good for our society. I went through my trial, managed to show the knowledge of everyone, showed the knowledge and the, um, the involvement of my seniors and my supervisors, etc. Managed to show, uh, if I can find it, uh, managed to show the, the chats that um, related to pushing the boundaries and how you wouldn't know how hard to push until you got a slap on the back of the wrist. Managed to show the chats that said, we know you guys are taking positions bigger than your limits, but necessary for delivering the profits we require, managed to show the emails where I clearly send messages saying, we generated $6 million today, we had $400 million of risk on. Boss replies, well done, followed by, uh, next time you're gonna break the risk li limit, tell me before, not after, in a very nervous way. So there was no hiding, there was no, anyway. Well, managed to show all that, and then the prosecution came to rest. And the judge said to them, I don't think you've made your case clear. Something along those lines. I've paraphrased that, but that's what the judge said. What are you going to do about it? This is the day that I was supposed to take the stand. And so for the next three days, as I waited, increasingly getting stressed, a phalanx of UBS lawyers and strategists and the police and the prosecution went into conference and they came back and they gave me two extra charges. Two charges that allowed them to isolate the nature of the charges. They basically used the new charges to isolate the two portions of the behavior that I've been talking about. One is about suppressing the profits, the P&L. The other is about suppressing the risk. And that becomes important, and I'll show you why in a minute. Again, I didn't realize what was going on. But I eventually took the stand, tired and emotional, confused and scared. And it kind of felt weird that the whole thing just was really structured against me. But for six days, they literally took me apart on the stand. Literally took me apart. Nevertheless, I tried to explain that I loved the bank, 
that I never intended to make personal financial gain, that I didn't, certainly didn't intend to cause the loss, that the losses only really happened because I lost the argument in June and July, that 20 hour days had compromised our clarity of thinking and our ability to make morally sound decisions, that we didn't intend to expose the bank to the risk of loss. Actually, our job was to expose the bank to the risk of gain. That I'd always wanted to protect my colleagues and my bank. And that's why I sent the email taking responsibility. I went on and on about the fact that all I cared about was trying to help the bank survive the crisis and then helping the bank to rebuild in 2010. Eventually, they let me step down from the stand. There's a paradox here. I understood that society needed a banker's head to roll. And I understood that the loss seemed really big. And I understood that I put myself in the fray. And I knew that after all the noise and the headlines, it would have been scandalous if I were found not guilty, since I was on the stand on my own. But the weird thing is, for those same reasons, for the same reason that our blame culture hurts us, the fact I was up there on my own was a problem too. Eventually, in his summing up, my judge said to the jury that they had to decide whether I had whether I had acted dishonestly in pursuit of personal financial gain for myself or another, whether I had intended to cause a loss or to expose the bank to the risk of loss. He explained that to determine dishonesty, they would have to consider the two-stage Gauche test for dishonesty. First, the objective test. Did they think that what I had done was dishonest according to the ordinary standards of reasonable people. And that's an important phrase, the ordinary standards of reasonable people. And second, they had to decide the subjective test. Did they think that I had realized that reasonable and ordinary people might think my actions were dishonest? They went away to deliberate. About a day and a half in, they came back and they asked the judge a question. If Ms. Stradiboli was doing what he was doing for his own gain, sorry, if Ms. Stradiboli wasn't doing what he was doing for his own gain, but was trying to make financial gain for the bank, can the bank be the other? Can the bank be the beneficiary in a criminal act? The judge told them, no, the other cannot be the bank. You can only find whether he intended to make a gain for himself or another human being. And if you can't be sure that he intended to make a gain for himself, then you must find him not guilty on the counts of false accounting because its elements are additive. However, in the Fraud Act, you don't need to find that he intended to make a gain for himself. You only need to find that he intended to expose the bank to the risk of loss. Now, I sat there listening to this going, bloody hell. He's telling them what to do. Anyway, that is how we ended up with the rather non-intuitive finding that I was guilty of a crime where I had not intended to make a gain for myself, even though the jury seemed to have determined that I intended to make a gain for the bank. And yet they also found that I intended to expose the bank to the risk of loss. It's a bit of a paradox. If I intended to make a gain for the bank, how did I intend to expose the bank to the risk of loss? Anyway, you can't read it, so I'll read it to you. The final charge with the non-guilty elements taken out basically read like this. While occupying a position, namely being a senior trader with Global Synthetic Equities, in which you are expected to safeguard or not to act against the financial interests of UBS Bank, you dishonestly abuse that position, intending thereby to expose UBS to the risk of loss. 
and it's kind of circular. It kind of says, you expose the bank to the risk of loss for the purpose, dishonestly, for the purpose of exposing the bank to the risk of loss, just for its own sake. And it kind of didn't make sense to us, to other traders, which, le which led us to this question, which is where we are today. Why does the law not work as a disincentive to cultural and systemic failure in our finance systems? It kind of felt like the whole thing was jimmied to make sure that I was found guilty because we needed to find me guilty. Now I'm not saying, I'm not trying to absolve myself of responsibility. I sent an email, I put myself in there. But the question needs to be asked. If we need the law to regulate behavior, then how do we set the law so that it does regulate behavior? Because actually, this is kind of confusing. What does the trader do? My job is to expose the bank to the risk. That's my job. It's also to do it not dishonestly, but how do you define what is dishonest if everything you're doing is known by the people around you and your behavior becomes acceptable practice. And I think that the law is failing primarily because the Gauche test is just not relevant in the 21st century. In the 21st century workplace, where we live in these complex bubbles, where one bubble just doesn't understand what's going on in the other bubble, who is the ordinary, reasonable man? In her powerful book, Willful Blindness, Margaret Heffernan makes the compelling case that in environments defined by extreme conflict, pressure, and complexity, individuals are prone to what she calls resource depletion, where they become utterly unable to make morally sound decisions. If you align that with the Gauche test, you come to a realization that actually we live in increasingly high-pressured, highly complex institutional bubbles where our human relationships are being destroyed by increasingly dislocated work environments defined by outsourcing or automation of the kinds of human support systems that help us better understand both when we might be doing something that could break us and or that we belong to societies outside of the walls of our institutions. What does that mean? That moment when I go to my boss and I say, I need help with this, and he says, you guys are the experts, you need to find a way, is a broken human relationship. That moment when I don't feel the courage to go and speak to my risk manager or my operational manager and say, I need help to find a solution to this problem, is a broken human relationship. And I think in deeply complex societies where we're driving people to go after very difficult measurable metrics, purely target driven objectives, we will increasingly fail. And I think that's what we're seeing today. There's a growing body of work by people like Dr. Mariam Kuchaki of Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management where it's being recognized that designing our workplaces in such a way where our risk takers are encouraged to push against regulatory boundary, boundaries, whilst regulatory functions are expected to police those very risk takers, creates excessive conflict. The internal conflict that then creates a corrosive culture that no amount of regulation or indeed punishment for failure can resolve. Even worse, the conflict results in what Kuchaki calls a loss of authenticity, a loss of integrity and self-esteem, as employees become unable to reconcile their own personal values with the culture and goals of their institutions. That's exactly what happened at UBS. It's exactly what happened to me. How do you reconcile? this desire, non sibi set omnibus, to give to my society with the other desire. Take as much as you can, extract as much as you can, pure profit-driven goals. In a world of extreme conflict, 
we're breaking our people. But there's another weird thing that we have to think about, which is whether there is such a thing as talent. Laszlo Bock, Margaret Heffernan, Professor James Flynn, and Carol Dweck, amongst many others, have all found that what we need, what, that we need to teach our workforces that they must no longer believe in the fallacy of talent. Whilst creativity is important in our search for innovation, we all have the ability to learn how to be creative. If we teach our people the importance of having a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset, they will understand that it's okay to make mistakes. What does that mean? Well, in our society, because of our blame culture, actually, because we're looking to punish people for failure, we're creating people of fixed mindsets. We're, we're not allowing people to learn from their mistakes. In environments defined by a, mixed, a fixed mindset, where people are encouraged to believe that talent and ability are fixed, those who are most creative are elevated to positions of special status, like we were. These guys are the superstars. You always see it whenever a trader fails. Former superstar trader, Kweku Adaboli. What does that mean? That means you put them on a pedestal, you call them a superstar. In our case, everyone else was told to emulate us, to try and help us to achieve the profit targets we were trying to achieve. And when you put them on that pedestal, what happens is they start to believe that their responsibility is to push boundaries to find ways to manipulate rules and systems. But if they fail, woe betide they who fail, because then we punish them. It's weird. It doesn't work. It creates a dynamic that leads them to believe that they're expected to push boundaries. That's what we were told. You've got to push the boundaries until you get a slap on the back of the wrist. But the problem is, this is when bad things happen. Because the others around them, who are not on this elevated plane, then allow them to do the things they're doing. They stop being the human voice that says, you know what guys, maybe you just need to not trade. Maybe you need to take a break. Maybe you need to take a week off. Maybe you need to not do that trade. But the human relationships are being compromised. If we inspire our people to foster a growth mindset instead, they will understand that we don't need to be afraid of failure, as failing doesn't discredit our ability. In fact, failure is how we learn and grow. Failure is fundamental to the human condition. From childhood, you fall down, get back up, you'll be all right, the pain will go. And you learn. You do a test. Your kids do a test. Not great. Well, next time, try harder. We'll spend a bit more time next time. That is how we learn as human beings. And yet in our institutions, people are not being allowed to fail. Instead, we create this weird system where we elevate some and leave the rest. And imagine being the guy who's not on the elevated plane. How do you then tell them, well, I still want you to bring your A-game to work every day? Doesn't work. However, if everyone develops a growth mindset, they will love the challenges they face. They will work in collaborative ways to resolve those challenges. They will know how to persist when things are tough, and they will know how to bounce back from failure. Most importantly, they will respect each other's relative creativity, and in so doing, trust in each other to help solve the problems in a collaborative way in support of a common and collegiate goal. Matthew Syed takes it a step further. We've talked about blame culture. But he explains that the blame culture in our society is doing, is doing us harm. Removing the fallacy of talent, developing growth mindsets, removing internal conflict are all really important. 
But then we have to realize that if we continue to foster our blame culture, sending Tom Hayes to prison for 11 years for something that he was recruited to do and taught to do in a handbook, if we continue to foster our blame cultures, we will not be equipped to make the changes we need in our societies and institutions. It's only through the realization the failure is fundamental to the human condition that we are able to put real solutions in place to advance the social contract. Once we've built a growth mindset, removed the conflict intentionally built into our institutions and rid ourselves of our blame culture, we then have to take the next step. The next step is that you have to bring together your compliance people, your risk and operational managers, and your risk takers, all together, physically closer, so they can build real human relationships. And I cannot think of a time when it's more important than today, on the tipping point of automation, of AI and machine learning, where we think we can just turn everything into data and shove it through a machine, and get answers that somehow support our social contract. We need to build real relationships, born of trust, sorry, born of trust, mutual respect, and an understanding of the complex pressures that all of our people face. Relationships that reflect everybody's place as a member of a society beyond the walls of our institutions and our sub-communities. Rather than working, rather than making our employees obsess about measurable metrics in pursuit of extractive profits, we need to give them purposeful work to do. Purposeful work that helps to resolve real global challenges. Challenges like our migratory problems, the distribution of the proceeds of human endeavor, etc. With mutual appreciation for each other's creativity in pursuit of altogether more purposeful outcomes, our people might better protect each other from failure whilst ensuring that the institutions they serve fulfill, fulfill this positive social contract for which they were originally conceived. Just kind of want to show you these three charts. And it's difficult for you to see what's on them, but these have been taken out of what's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. Every year, there's a company called Edelman that assesses the level of trust in our society. And what they found is that there's a high level of fear in our global societies. It's very difficult to show you what these say, but basically, Trump voters and Brexit voters, when asked how fearful they are about the state of our society, tend to be more fearful than those who might have voted Remain or might have voted for Hillary Clinton. And what it boils down to is that there's a very high level of mistrust in our systems. There's a mistrust that our institutions are acting in service of our needs. That mistrust is something that we all need to recognize, that we have to act now. We have to rebuild our systems. <laughs> it's absolutely critical, because I've gone from up here via Ghana and Israel and Yorkshire and Nottingham and London to down here, being cast out of my, my home 
at risk of deportation. And what I've seen on that journey is the massive inequality in our society. <coughs> the massive disenfranchisement down here. And if we don't do something about it, I'm extremely fearful that the alternative, if we fail in this moment where we need to build trust and rebuild the social contract, if we fail in this moment, my fear is that the alternative will be a massive and final collapse of trust in our societies. After what I've seen in the last five years, I think we can do something about it. But we need to act. There's cause for hope. I don't want you to go home sad. <laughs> if there's one thing I've also learned on this journey, is that it's the moment of greatest despair where you dig the deepest, you find a way to stand back up. As a global society, that's where we are today. And there are many people trying to find answers. Margaret Heffernan, Matthew Syed, Raul Martinez, the Forward Institute, many people, all of you who are here today just to listen to me talk. But you go away from here, please share the lessons, talk to the people you work with, the people you live with, and ask them the questions, what can we do? Because I think that's the real reason that I was sent to prison, to come back and bring you that message. Thank you very much. I'll be honest, I don't really know how to follow that. Um, okay, so really what I would like to do now is just open the floor, floor to a couple of questions. I'm going to take the standard form, so raise of hands, I'll nominate somebody, if just say who you are, where you're from, and then direct your questions to Kwaku. We're going to have maybe 10-15 minutes of that, and then we do have a small wine reception afterwards. So I suppose, show hands guys. It seems to me from where I'm sitting here and what you're saying, <coughs> the guys that were reported you just left your scapegoat. Um, where you go? Yeah, so this happens a lot. Um, in, in highly complex systems where uh, you're also expecting people to take risk to innovate, um, s the system is designed to isolate responsibility at the lowest possible level. That's why they send the lawyers in, they bunker the whole thing, they stop the information coming out because they're trying to protect the senior levels of the institution in order to protect the institution. Um, I'm trying to answer the question without answering the question. It's, always, it's what happens all the time. And I think we need to tell the truth about it, actually. It's not good for us. I think we have a question over there. Uh, two questions to get there. Hello, I'm not your acquaintance. Hello, Ben. <laughs> uh, first question is, you talk about blame. And yep. the airline industry there was uh, developed where they basically said, not having blame. Um, it was a problem to speak up. Um, yeah. And I mean, certain groups we join to introduce them to certain other areas like medicine, etc. Do you think the banking industry would A, tolerate that, and B, would it have been admitted to the industry as a whole or the and then the society that actually happened? Um, will the banking industry tolerate it? Well, uh, they need to. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a really valid uh, point and it's the one that Matthew Syed makes in Black Box Thinking, um, which is that you have to build learning systems um, and they have to be built on a platform of complete openness, which means that you can't have blame. So if I'm going to come to you and say, you know, I'm a whistleblower, this is what I've seen, I can't be at risk of getting in trouble. At the same time, I need to be able to put up my hand and say, I've made a mistake. Uh, 
you know, help me fix it. Um, but if, if I'm in an environment like UBS became incredibly toxic, where everyone was trying to protect their, their turf, what happens is you can't speak up. Um, the banking industry needs an absolute revolution. Not, it, at the moment it thinks, it, so it's sort of like, oh, well, we can catch people out. You know, we'll use machine learning and we'll record all the phone calls and all the emails and all of the chat conversations and make everyone use like a work mobile so we can monitor everything and we'll stick a machine on it and it'll flag up the change in behavior that indicates, you know, bad behavior. It's bollocks. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And it creates a massive sense of mistrust. And that mistrust leads to more bad behavior, more failure because of blame. So I don't think they're open to it. And I think the way they're approaching it is wrong. Um, and if they don't change, there'll just be another, another crisis, another failure. So the second question is, you talked about so <laughs> the bailout yep. that the British has and the British is too big to fail. If we'd not bailed them out, would the culture be different? I suspect so because the survivors would have been those who had the better culture. So if you look at banks like Standard Chartered, who have a slightly different product mix, less you know, aggressive, risky um, investment banking uh, products, and much more sort of uh, corporate lending, sort of merchant lending type activities, um, they're also built upon a platform of openness and everyone working together. This is a great example of a bank that would have easily survived the crisis because it had that culture. So if you'd have let more banks fail and then used, you, we would have needed to support, we would have still needed to support people, but supported those who uh, uh, who needed support because they were doing something that was in support of the social contract or who had a culture that um, meant that they were less affected than the others. I think if we'd have let the banks fail eight years ago, and we would have let the debt be written off back then, we would be well along the way to proper recovery now. Whereas we wouldn't be in this situation where we are now where even the threat of removing stimulus the 12, 13 trillion dollars of stimulus, even the threat of removing a little bit of it creates panic in the market. Um, but who holds the power? I don't know. Hi. Hi. Donald Trump has signed the executive order to review the Dodd Frank Act. Yep. One of the things banned on the Volcker Room was. The CFO of JP Morgan yesterday came out and said, we hope for deregulation. We think that now is a good time to relax the restrictions. And those restrictions are primarily about the level of leverage that banks can hold, i.e. how big their proprietary trading positions can be. Considering that they're making record profits now, I'm not entirely convinced they need extra stimulus. Um, and so therefore, all, <laughs> all that's going to happen is they're going to increase leverage and then the business cycle will turn and then the bubble will implode. Yeah, I mean like, it's almost guaranteed. Because the, the alternative is a forever growing debt pile with a diminishing return on debt, which is unsustainable <coughs> in itself. So um, the simple answer to your question is, I think this is not the time to deregulate. Because actually deregulation is about, as I said at the beginning, legislative intent. It's not, it doesn't really make a difference, actually. But 
it sets the tone of what we want you to do. If you deregulate, what you're saying to the institutions are, we want you to, you know, find your animal spirits and take more <coughs> risk. If you tell people to take more risk, they will take more risk. It's a command. And if they take more risk, there's an increased risk of failure. It's simple. And I think if we re-leverage the system too far, we already have, but if we go even further, I think it's potentially very dangerous. Right, well, given it's my party, I'm going to ask one final <coughs> question if you don't sure. mind. Uh, given I spend a fair amount of my time lecturing students on the role of the regulator, yeah. and the regulator is so important to be involved in the markets, yeah. it seems you didn't spend well, any time speaking about the role of the FSA, yeah. what is now the FCA. What's your opinion on that? Were they involved? Were you thinking about them at the time when this was all happening? Um, so, it was in my notes, but I had to sort of find some time. Um, basically, um, what, what's, I didn't find out until like a year later when I got disclosure. But actually what happened is that the bank knew straight away, because you can see all the interviews. They knew straight away. The regulator knew, you know, and we're talking the involvement of other people and the detail of what happened. The regulator knew three weeks later the police didn't find out till a year later, right? And the regulator has had a weird role to play where um, they interviewed everyone, but they never interviewed me. And they sort of wrote their reports, but didn't make them public. And then I got convicted, and then both the regulators, the Swiss regulator and the UK regulator, both came out with a report basically saying UBS had created this environment and encouraged the behavior and that therefore they were they needed to pay a fine because not only had they done that but they also hadn't controlled me then like you know two years later they ended up prohibiting my supervisor from working in the industry because of his involvement and his knowledge um, the problem is the language that the regulator uses fails to factor in anything, any of the environmental factors that we talk about, where we say, actually, the system kind of needs to change because this stuff keeps happening. Eight months, I was still in Wandsworth when the London Whale thing happened. And if you look at the language around the London Whale, it's exactly the same thing, just four times bigger. Recently, we've had Wells Fargo, basically where people are under so much pressure to open accounts that they open fake accounts. We've had <coughs> countless accounting overstatements. And I think that the regulator is kind of asleep at the wheel. And it's a relative respect thing, actually, because until the institutions recognize the value of the regulator in protecting our societies, the regulators down here and the institutions are up here. And actually what you need to do is you need to go into the institution, you need to make everyone start working together, you need to remove all of that internal conflict, then make them do purposeful work, like literally force them, say to them, you have to do purposeful work. You need to do stuff that benefits the social contract, otherwise there's no point in you doing it and we're not going to allow you to spend leverage on it. Then when the people who work within those institutions start to remember that they're a member of a wider society, they're not just there to extract as much profit as possible, they will start to recognize the value of the regulator. Then the regulator will be elevated in terms of mute, relative respect. And when that happens, the regulator is no longer policing this entity, it's acting as a guide. So what you need is your regulator to be like a moral guide. If it spends all its time trying to catch these guys out, they're always going to be disrespected. But if they're setting a moral guide going, this is what our society needs, come on guys, come with us. Because actually you're aware of your moral, your, your societal contract and what you need to contribute, right? You then have this sort of mutual respect, which means that young people will choose, oh, I'll go work for an investment bank because it's a mental challenge. Or oh, I'll go work for a regulator because I'm doing something good for my society. But they're, you know, 
both respected. Then you get this sort of symbiotic system where they both recognize, I need the regulator to guide me and to m help me to meet the social contract. And the regulator goes, I'm valued because I'm setting the direction and I'm helping these guys to meet the social contract. And so you now have this nice sort of relative respect and it can work. Until that happens, it's never going to work. I'm going to call it now if you don't mind. We'll have a chat with Quaker with I'm sure you're going to be hanging around yeah. a little bit afterwards. Uh, can we just say thank you?